can you all hear me? Um, before I, I launch into some, some thoughts and tips, I got to tell you one quick story since Mike introduced me. And there's always, you know, you always got to take advantage of payback. Um, uh, uh, Mike and I have served on a committee and uh, Mike was, you know, giving his opinion and, and that's what was all great. Um, but in the course of the, the, the meeting, um, I proceeded to tell a story about Mike um, and then make fun of Mike. Um, and, and I'm telling you that because everyone else at the meeting turned pale. Some of them slid underneath the, the desks um, that, oh my gosh, how can anyone be making fun of the provost? And I, that's, that's, why not? You know, <laughs> it's, it was there. He, you know, he set it up. So uh, thank you, Mike, for those, those kind words. Um, well, so the, the circumstances have brought me here, um, circumstances that I'm, you know, not particularly excited to have, have gone through. Um, I was diagnosed with a, a rare soft tissue sarcoma in my leg um, in early 2013 and lost my femur uh, because of that. It's since metastasized to my lungs um, and I've lost half of each lung and the tumors, um, despite radiation and chemo and, and targeted therapy, um, continue to grow and, um, and make it difficult for me to breathe. Uh, and so as Mike suggested, um, with this medical sabbatical, I wanted to make sure that I, I had at least um, you know, one last chance to, to give back to the university. And um, you know, we have a lot of, a lot of people um, in, in all professions and all lines of discipline that will complain about their jobs and complain about this or that. Um, I've been blessed here at Edinburgh. Everything that I've ever wanted to do and everything I've, I've, I've tried to do has been supported by the university. Um, and so I'm grateful and I'm, uh, I never really planned on staying in Edinburgh. For me, this was, this was a, gonna be a, just a brief exile uh, into the Northeast and I'd hopefully get back to, to Oregon or Washington, but um, it ended up being um, the best thing possible for me. When I first got here in 1996, um, I, I saw myself as a historian first. I'm a historian first, that's, I, that's it. Um, I only did the, the classroom shtick because I had to. That's, how, that's what allowed me to, to, you know, to go and do my research. If I wanted to be a historian, I had to pay my dues and, and put in my you know, 17 hours of, of teacherly responsibilities in order to be the historian that I had I had trained to become and wanted to become. Um, but very quickly on, um, it became abundant, abundantly clear to me um, that I liked the classroom. Um, the, the classroom was, was fun, it was vibrant, um, and I, I think at a certain point, maybe the classroom liked me. Um, and so uh, as I proceeded through you know, the next 20 years, um, I worked at being the best teacher possible. I've never taken a single class in, in education, pedagogy, whatever you want to call it. Um, I learned by the, by the seat of my pants, um, sometimes the hard way, um, but um, I wanted to be a good teacher because there was so much um, out there. Um, and so um, while I came here as a historian, um, I'm proud to leave here as, as an educator. Um, and I think, uh, I hope that uh, in the course of those 20 years, the, the, the passion I have for my subject was translated uh, to them as well. So I, I wrote down um, six, six or so, I don't know how many lessons, uh, tips um, that I found critical for my success in the classroom. Um, and they're real basic. Um, they're so basic that um, it's not just good for uh, success in the classroom, but it's also good for success in your career. And I would. Frankly, I would say that if you, if you followed these lessons, you might be even successful in life in whatever you perceive. Well, the first thing then, and it's, it's something you've all heard, but I think I tried to take it to a new level, and that is to know your audience. Um, you know, it's, and it's more than just simply knowing, um, oh, the, you know, it's this demographic or that demographic. Um, I literally wanted to know who my students were. Um, and so for every class, I required my students to hand in a piece of paper with their name, their hometown, and their major 
um, and hand it to me personally. And then once I got it, I would ruffle through them, and then I would proceed to name every student in the class um, by, the, by those cards. Um, and it was, it's, a, it's a silly skill. It's a, it's a mental skill that I, I think anybody can do. I just happen to, to practice it um, and, and get my mind kind of channeled for it. But I think it's important um, to know our, st our students' names because it makes them the student. It gives them an identity. It tells them that we care. It tells them that they matter in the course of, of our teaching, that they're not anonymous. They're not just some random number who sits in the back of the classroom, that they're real people who deserve the respect of, of their faculty. And I've had, I can't tell you how many students I've, I've come across who said, I've, I've had that professor four years, and they still don't know my name. And it, and it breaks my heart. How can you inspire? How can you motivate? How can you cultivate a curiosity among students if you don't know their names? And so knowing their names is, um, is important. And we'll come back to that um, in, here in a second as well. But I think also in, in knowing your audience, uh, by doing so, you, uh, you, you construct an opportunity for dialogue. You, you give them an opportunity to engage one another and with you in a dialogue that allows the, the education to increase. Knowing their name also makes them responsible. Because when they're anonymous um, and they skip class, you can't call them out. You can't call out when you see them on the steps of the empty keg. You can't say, student 100745, you know, they're not going to know what the hell that is. But when they're sitting on the steps of the empty keg, and you say, Dave Markley, what are you doing over there? Why weren't you in class? And then Dave says, you know, his head drops. Dave's right here in the front row, so. <laughs> He's in class next. And so there's a higher expectation. And once you know them, and once you have demonstrated that you care to know them, then they, have, they feel a sense of obligation to do, to do well that they don't want to disappoint Dr. Lath because he's gone so far to know my name and, and, and to learn stuff about me. So knowing your audience um, is central. I've also, as, as part of that know your audience concept, um, I, I've always believed that there is no such thing as a bad student. There's no such thing as a problem student. Um, if, if I have a, an issue in the classroom, it's probably because of me. If, if the student is struggling, well, you know what, that's not their fault. You know, ignorant students don't know they're ignorant. Students who are, are, are behaving in such a way that, that is rude and, and you know, disruptive, they don't necessarily know that that's rude and disruptive. They've never had anyone teach them that and call them out. And so I've always felt like, you know, it's my responsibility. So long as they're in the four walls of my classroom, that it's my responsibility to get them to that next level. Um, and so I, I try to treat them with respect, and, um, and when they do struggle, and they are what we'd call the problem student, I have to find the new solution. So I, I'm the problem until it's solved. Um, and so knowing your audience is critical. Now, I, this, this presentation, when it was initially being conjured up, Stacy, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was navigating the classroom and the campus, right? That kind of philosophy of knowing your audience um, extends to your colleagues, not just on a campus, but in every discipline you work in. Um, if you want to rise in your profession, network. M make connections with your, with your coworkers. You know, become allies in such a way that they'll help you get to the next step you want to get to. And so knowing your audience and who you're working with is central all along the way. Um, and then in the end, uh, there's no better um, suggestion or to way to improve your life it, uh, as to know your audience. You know, you, we, we speak differently to people um, under different circumstances. The way you speak to your mother is uh, different, I, I pray, than the way you speak to your friends, uh, and different than the way you speak to, to others. Um, and so it's important to know, you know what proper venues um, uh, you know, accord certain languages um, and customs. And so know your audience is a central kind of feature um, for success, and it's uh, been at the heart of mine. 
the second uh, lesson I would suggest is life is a lesson. There's not a single thing that you can't learn from. Um, you know, I understand that when you're in my classroom, you have lives beyond the, the four walls of that classroom. And when students come up to me and say, you know, I've got this going on, I said, that, okay, that's all right. I, I, I trust you. Learn something from that process. Make yourself better along the way um, and, and turn it into something good. Um, you know, I'd much rather them uh, attend the funeral of their grandmother than attend my lecture on the Chicago race riots of 1919, even though it's a really good lecture. Okay? Uh, that's, just, that's just the heart of it. Life is a lesson, and so everything we can do along the way um, has purpose. Now, a lot of my colleagues give assessments or tests um, as a means of measuring the student's knowledge. Um, I think there's, there's um, value to that to a certain extent. But I've always looked at um, tests as an opportunity for a student to learn. That um, I'll give an exam, an essay exam. They'll have one week um, to choose the question of their choice that we wrote as a class. Um, they'll go home and for one week they'll prepare, they'll get notes, they'll do re additional research, they'll marshal the evidence and form a solid argument. I don't, I don't want to ambush my students because very rarely are we in life ambushed. You know, unless you're going to be a, you know, an ER surgeon, you're, you're very rarely going to be put in a position where you don't have a chance to kind of think something through. Uh, and so rather than giving them just quick tests and assessments, I gave them lessons. Giving them the test actually made them learn certain things. It was a pedagogical tool. Um, and so um, testing is just you know, one way of, of rethinking um, how, we, how we do these kind of things. Um, in addition, um, in my courses, uh, I gave my students a lot of work. Um, I had a colleague who would give a midterm exam and a final exam. And if you blew the first exam, you were doomed. Uh, and then there was no chance you were going to be able to, to salvage your grade. Um, that just strikes me as unfair and unfortunate. Um, we need to be able to foster students the opportunity for growth, that when they do stumble and they do make a mistake, that they can pick themselves up, learn from that mistake, and go on and grow. So I give my students lots of opportunities to stumble, um, and, and a lot will. And a, a lot of students will continue to, to stumble along the way and kind of they get just enough you know, noose uh, to hang themselves with. But um, I think if we give them the opportunities um, to grow, um, they'll take it. Edinburgh students are very industrious. They'll do the work. Um, but if you don't challenge them and give it to them, they're not going to you know, seek it out. Um, they have other things going on. Um, life is a lesson on campus, and it's life is a lesson in life. Um, I've been on a lot of committees. Um, and um, one of the most important lessons I learned uh, being on committees is that they spin. They go, they go around and around and around. Um, I went to one committee and we, we talked about it and talked about it and then the next week we came back and we talked about it and talked about it and the next week we came back and we talked and we never got off the ground. I was, so, you know, I have time. I have things to do. I had, I had two small children at home. I had things I wanted to accomplish. I had, you know, books to write and things to do and, and jokes to play and, and pranks to, you know, commit. I had, you know, I had a full agenda. Um, going to a committee and spinning in circles is not, very, is not very cool. So what I ultimately decided to do, and I've maintained it ever since, is that I'll meet the first one or two meetings to see if they're, if they're wheel spinners. And if they are, uh, and we're not making any progress, I will submit the proposal. And I'll, I'll write it all out, I'll submit it, and you know what? That'll either serve as the, the jumping point for, for discussion or the jumping point for a change or a model or a plan, or they can scrap it. And if they're going to scrap it and go in circles, then I know I can be removed from the committee. So um, it, it works a, a variety of ways. But um, it's all about learning from the mistakes and the problems you encounter um, in um, the classroom and in committees. The, um, a third element um, that I would recommend 
um, is empathy. Um, I think we often expect our students to be spoon-fed and um, to be, uh, to just do it. And in the process, they aren't taught perhaps one of the most important human qualities uh, and, and given the opportunities to foster the most important human qualities of empathy. You know, when it's all said and done, the, the things you've learned in, in all of your classes, they're going to be outdated in, in 50 years. There will be new books on, on chemistry, biology, everything's going to be radically different. But you know what? The one thing won't be different is how we relate to one another, how we get along, how we treat one another, why we ought to treat each other with respect, why we ought to, to listen out um, other people's opinions and voices. Um, and so I try to, to be empathetic in class and to foster um, that empathy amongst my students. And for some, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, but I think, you know, we, we as a human species, we have an innate empathy. We have an innate sympathy. How many of you have ever watched uh, uh, American Home videos? Okay. When, when those people crash on their skateboards, um, yeah, yeah, we laugh, but <laughs> uh, we also cringe and like, ooh, ooh, ah, you know, and we're feeling their pain in a kind of, a, a, you know, an extended version. So we already have that ability to be empathetic and sympathetic. Now we need to, to reach it to our students. Um, you know, the world's changing very fast, and when it's all said and done, um, the most important thing that we're going to have to figure out is how are we going to take care of each other? Well, technology will be doing so much for us, um, it's going to be a challenge. We're going to have to figure out how we get along, whether it's between men and women, uh, between straights and gays, between whites and blacks, but whoever it might be, we have to develop an empathy and, and solve that. And since college students are a minority of the world's population, um, I think maybe it behooves us um, as college people um, to take the lead in that. Um, I think part of being empathetic um, is also being authentic, being transparent, um, letting people know who you really are. Um, I think, Mike, you, you kind of alluded to it. Um, uh, you, uh, when you get Joey Lath, you get Joey Lath. <laughs> uh, you, you be prepared that I'm going to harass you. I'm going to poke fun at you. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support you, and I'm going to carry you at times, but I'm also at times going to tell you, you know, this is the time you've got to do it yourself. Um, but when you're authentic and you're honest, um, people trust you. And then when people trust you, you have the, the responsibility and the burden of carrying out that trust and, and being good to those people and making sure that you're taking care of them. And so, you know, I, I don't know to what extent um, we talk about empathy um, in any other class, but we ought to talk about it more because it's really at the heart of, the, you know, the fundamental human experience. Um, I put on this list organization, um, and I absolutely believe in being organized. Um, I think the only reason I, I kept it on the list um, is because I have to be organized, um, and I felt guilty taking it off the list. Um, I organize my day. I have a to-do list. I have, a, I have the to-do list that I won't accomplish today, but will probably get to tomorrow list. Um, I number things. I have an outline form. I'm, I am very, you know, OCD in, uh, in terms of, you know, controlling my, my environment. Um, but organization will get you far, because ultimately, if you're not organized, you can't be spontaneous. If you have a plan, you're going to go down this route, you know what, if you want to deviate from it, then you say, I'm being spontaneous. If you just are spontaneous all the time, all that is is last minute planning. And, and you have no idea where you're going to go. So set an objective, set where your ideal, you know, distant point is, and then, then head for it and be spontaneous along the way. Be spontaneous all the way from the very beginning, you'll get lost. You'll, you'll get caught off in, in a number of side roads and, and whatnot. Another quality that I, I think we need to bring to the classroom is empowerment. I, I want my students to know and, and feel that they are powerful. Um, you know, the students will come in, you know, on occasion and say, 
you know, tuition this or tuition that or, you know, new university policy that, you know, they, they'll complain about university policy. And I say, well, you have the power, not me. I, you know, I'm, I'm there, you know, I'm their toady. You know, they pay me and I do what I'm told to do. But, uh, you know, you students, you're the ones paying the, the tuition. You have the financial power, albeit you're here for four years or in some cases six, uh, to, to actually make a mark on the university. So, you know, to, to empower them with the, the responsibility of doing something good um, for the university. But I also challenge them to, to empower themselves in the community, to do good for the, not only for the university, but for the community as a whole. And so I always ask them to do um, Project Rake, um, a number of, of um, community service projects. Um, I make my students participate in the, the Martin Luther King um, Expressions of Remembrance Art Contest, you know, and, and do things that are, that are good for the university, good for the community, and that, you know, spark their interest in, in other areas. When we empower our students, it means that they take a more active role in their education. Um, you know, I don't know how many of you have had students where they, they come in, they, they want to be told what classes they have to take, and then, um, whether they sign up for them or not, and then they come back and the next semester they do the same thing. They don't know what they want, but no one's really given them the responsibility of handling it. And so I try to, I try to give empowerment to my students, to be mentors. And to you know, raise their own expectations um, of themselves. But I think the last thing um, that I'll share with you before I do a quick story here. Um, I think the last part is um, to have fun. Um, I, I had fun in my classes. I can't say whether my students had fun, but I had fun. Uh, I used crazy voices. Um, uh, for those of you who know World War I, is there anyone out there who can tell me the German plan to uh, invade France? Markley? Actually, they haven't said that. Uh huh, okay. Come on, crosses. Oh, no, you, hands too. The Schlieffen plan. Yeah. So it's those kind of simple things where you convert a, a, a term into you know, a, a horrible German accent and, and you know, Nazi fingers, you know, because that's, that's all the Nazis ever did. Um, it, it changed them and, and, and they remember them. Um, and, and they have fun in the classroom. Um, and when they have fun, well guess what, they're learning. I don't know how, how many of my colleagues say, you know, okay, you gotta be hard on these kids. Well, okay, that's fine, be hard on them. But that doesn't mean learning has to be hard. Learning can be fun, can be enjoyable. You can laugh along the way, you can, you can tell silly jokes, you can tell stories about yourself. I use horrible analogies. Every war that I te teach um, in US 2 ends up be in, a, uh, in an analogy about a bar fight. And, and of course, I then tell them, if you're in a bar fight, do not use this strategy. So, um, but uh, to have fun. It's, it, uh, I've always lived by the principle of, uh, if you do what you love, you'll do it well. And if you do it well, you'll be compensated for it. Um, you don't want to be someone who, who leaves, you know, this university um, and, uh, and doesn't love or doesn't have a passion for what they do. It's our, our responsibility as instructors to cultivate those passions and to show them that, you know what, you don't have to have this major for this career. You can have this major and go into an entirely different career. You know, the employers aren't looking for majors. They're looking for articulate, clear-thinking, responsible, mature adults who can get the jobs done. Now, there are certain areas that have, you know, specializations and they, they need a little refinement, but that's what grad school is for. And so, um, having fun um, is, has been part of my, my trick, I think. Um, if I'm going to enjoy my classroom, um, you know, I, I've got to do certain things to spruce it up, um, whether it be practical jokes or the funny voices um, or the the tricks that I play on students um, about, you know, the Cold War or whatnot. Um, but ultimately, um, I think we have to create this curious um, student
who wants to go out and learn um, for themselves. Um, learning doesn't have to be painful. Um, and I don't think um, the students in my class um, felt pained. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to bet that there were days that they felt stressed, but they weren't, they weren't suffering, I'm willing to bet. Um, I just, to, to illustrate for my, my colleagues, um, the fellow professors here, um, in an average 100 or 200 level class, um, the students in my classes will write 35 to 40 pages of essays. Um, they'll have uh, between 15 to 20 online quizzes. They'll read three monographs. They'll do a community service project. They'll do an art project. And they'll overwhelmingly show up at 8 o'clock, 9.30, and 11 o'clock for those classes. So something must be working for these students to get up at 8 o'clock and to do the punishing you know, routine of, of Dr. Lay's you know, lecture on populism. You know, which even, you know, as I look at the notes, it's like, oh, you know. But, but we turn it around. We make it fun. Um, well, the last thing I, I'm going to say is, and I think, it, I think it's true of, of education and it's true of life. I think it's true of, of what we do. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my discipline to say it, but, you know, history is not names and dates. History isn't wars and elections. That's not what it is. History is, history is the, the human experience over time. History is, is humans um, trying to figure out what it's all about in what brief period they have on this, this planet. History isn't all you know, generals and, and dead white men. Right? History is, is a whole more. It's, it, it's when you took your child and held their hand to the, the school bus uh, for the first day of school. That's history. Um, it's when you're celebrating a, you know, a Steelers win um, and you know, clanking your, your beer glasses um, with your friends. That's, that's part of the historical human experience. Um, when, when you hold a loved one and you can feel their, their, their breathing on your own chest, you know, that, that intimacy, that's history. It, it's the human experience. It's not dry names and dates. And what makes it, I think, so fundamentally cool is that regardless of our disciplines here in this room, we're really all asking the same question. Who are we and where do we fit in? You know, it's, uh, sociologists might be asking, who are we as we relate to one another? Psychologists might be asking, who are we as we relate to the brain? Astronomers, who are we as we relate to, to the universe? Theologians, who are we uh, as we relate to the, the superior power? Historians are simply asking the question, who, who are we? Uh, and answering it, well, who we are can be defined by where we've come from. And so um, I think when we understand that we're all human and that we're all in this struggle together and that we're all sharing this time together and if we can be present to one another and be kind to one another, um, and understand that we're all just trying to figure it out, then the journey in the classroom, regardless of whether it's history or some other class, um, it, it's a valuable trip. Um, you know, my journey is coming to an end, uh, and I'm blessed. I'm, I've been blessed to live the life I love. I've, I've had the most remarkable, remarkable life. Um, I cannot complain about a single thing. Um, there are so many other people out there who have not had the opportunities that I've had. There are people out there who have not uh, gotten the same kind of help or support or family or friends. Um, and, and so how can I complain about that? And when it's all said and done, I, th not a day has gone by where I haven't laughed. And you know what? That laughter makes me feel good. Um, and so I think when it's all said and done, you know, maybe as instructors and, and those of you who are going to be future instructors, we think about um, bringing it down to the most basic fundamental level, and that is loving each other, sharing with one another, being kind to one another, being present to one another, um, and laughing and loving along the way. Thank you.
Um, well, it, it actually was that, that last shtick there about the, what, you know. No, no, I don't, I don't have any of that. I, you know what, I'm not a storyteller. I'm, I, I take other stories and make them my own. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't create stories. Um, but, you know, uh, Mike did, since it was a plug that he did earlier, um, I, it, it dawned on me when I, was fi I got the, the medical sabbatical that um, I didn't have time to publish the works I wanted to publish. Um, I had a number of works that were sitting on my desk um, that I needed to work on and, and refine, but given the timeline I've been given, there was no chance in hell that I'd, I'd be able to get those finished um, in, in time. And so um, the first one, Under Earth, was actually just a, seri it's a, a story I told my children before bed. I'd tell them a story and they'd say, well, well, tell me more tomorrow night. And I'd be like, oh no, now I gotta go. Now I gotta go figure this out and add on to the story. And so that, that story is really just, um, it's the stories I told my daughters over the course of time. And uh, the only reason I published it is because I wanted them to have a copy um, of that, you know, to, to go in and ha share with their children down the line. The second book is entitled Crystal Knock, um, and it's actually, it's, I didn't know it existed until I wrote it. Uh, there is a genre of literature called Holocaust genre. And so this story is, it's kind of like a Anne Frank's diary meets the village, okay? You know, M. Night Shyamalan's The Village. Um, uh, and it's very, uh, I, I found it very interesting and I've already received a number of responses um, and I haven't even sh shared this with my wife. The uh, Tukwila School District out in Washington State uh, appears to be adopting it as one of their, their books for their classrooms. Um, so that's, you know, a nice, um, a nice thing. Basically, the ideas that I shared with you tonight are in, the, are in this book, Haunting the Past. Um, I wrestle with what is history, what is memory, what are dreams, and, and how do they intersect. Um, but then I also give you tips on, on how to teach social studies, um, how you can improve your mind in terms of memory. Because it's not just a freakish thing that I can, you know, remember everybody's names and I know the first 100 winners of the, the Kentucky Derby. Um, those are things I practiced um, and for a purpose. I learned the, the 100 winners of the Kentucky Derby because it was a good bar trick. Um, you know, you, if I can recite the first 100 winners, you get free drinks, well, I get free drinks. So <laughs> I learned the first 100 winners. But then what I discovered is if you, if you keep learning things like that, you keep kind of memorizing things and mastering bodies of information, then it became easier and easier to do it in subsequent terms. So, you know, the first time I memorized my student's name, it was hard. I, I, I struggled. Second time, easy. Third, you know, after 20 years, you know, it was easy. And, and I found out also, if you don't know a girl's name, you say either Jessica or Chelsea. And so, <laughs> you, you're pretty, pretty safe. Um, so, uh, those memory skills are, are included in here. And so, it's, it is, um, it is a, an academic work in that I've backed up um, some of my argument with evidence. Um, it is not an academic work in that I simply did not have the time to get it peer reviewed or go through the traditional <coughs> academic process. Um, I just simply went through an, an, another channel um, free of charge and, and reaped the benefits of it. So. What is the biggest life lesson you've learned? Um, the biggest lesson in life? Um, to give. There's, you know, the, the old adage, it's better to give than to receive. You know, that hasn't stuck around for, you know, for millennia, just, you know, for luck's sake. It, it, it truly is the, the greatest thing, the greatest reward you'll get in life is giving, whether it's giving physical items to someone or giving your time, giving your energy, your exper expertise spending time to give to someone else, that's absolutely the most rewarding thing ever. Um, you know, I'm not, gonna, I'm not taking anything with me. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be cremated, and, and Chris has to, you know, sprinkle me at various spots, you know, uh, across the country, uh, including Soldier Field. You were on record for that now. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, 
But, you know, otherwise, what am I taking with me? I don't, I don't need this. I don't need a new that. You know, what, what I do need is to give to other people who can benefit, you know, from those things. Um, we're, we're, we're a society that's bent on accumulation um, of material goods and other things. And so when people say, you know, what's your bucket list? Uh, you know, oh, like, I want to go collect something. I, I need to accomplish something. Jumping out of an airplane? No. <laughs> I'm already dying. You know, why, why would I get myself any closer to it? Um, but you know what? Giving, giving to people and giving them something is so much rewarding than that. So when they ask me about the bucket list, you know, my answer is I've been living my bucket list. I've been doing it for you know, the last 40 years. So I don't know. It's, does that make sense, Tommy? Uh, let's see, 90, I got I got to think here, 98, 99, 2004, 6, 8, 10. I did six summer road courses in which I did 30 days of taking students um, across the American West to study um, the landscape, the environment, the history of these local places. Um, I was young, um, ambitious, naive, <laughs> um, and uh, I, think it, I think it was a, a great program that we did, um, and we were going to have one in 2013. Joe Reese and I uh, had thought about doing a combined um, geology and, and history one. Um, I, I drove vans with students, <laughs> and students drove vans behind me with students. 7,000 miles of driving with students. And we, uh, no one died. We had no major accident. So in 2013, it, you know, Joe and I, I just said to Joe, I'm, I can't. My t I pushed my luck. I can't do it anymore. Uh, something bad has got to happen. And, <laughs> and it ended up being cancer. <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's, I wouldn't call them my road trips the highlight of my career. But um, they were a unique chapter, for sure. Other questions? Uh, I'm Dr. Joseph Lath, professor of history. <laughs> I am, I, I would first and foremost identify myself as the father of Lydia and Isabella. Um, I, uh, I am the husband of Chris. I am uh, the professor of a number of people here. Um, but in the end, it, it wasn't who am I that is really the question. It's who are we as a people? And how do we fit in? Um, how do we de decide how we're going to get along and how are we going to operate with one another? Um, so it's a, it's a bigger question that I think every discipline asks just from a different vantage point. Um, and I hope, you know, that somewhere along the line, we come to the answer that we're human and that we're flawed, that we make mistakes. Yeah, we laugh and, and we have, in, have fun, but we also, we make mistakes. We don't learn from our history. We get angry, we get greedy, we lust, you know, we steal. We do all different types of things that are perhaps not the best things to do. But those are the mistakes that we all make as humans um, that we need to learn from. And in doing so, become better people. Um, again, I, I, history is not a science. History, from my perspective, is, is an art. It's, it's you know, um, you know 10,000 years ago, it was the shaman standing around the fire you know, telling this, you know, his people who they were and where they came from, and telling them the old stories of the, the you know, the, the, the mountain lion in the, in, you know, the tree, or the, the wolf that you know, started a flood, whatever it might be. Those creation myths are history, and it was those people trying to tell their own history uh, to create an identity for themselves as a people. Uh, and so, yeah, 10,000 years later, we've tried to make it a science, 
And I know a lot of the students out there who are history students are like, yeah, footnotes, you know, and they're grumbling and complaining. That's, unfortunately, that's part of where we are in our discipline right now. We've got to back it up with evidence. Um, but I'd also suggest that, you know what, we need to be creative and playful. We need to learn to tell our history in other ways beyond the dusty books that we've been you know, writing, including myself. We need to tell history through cartoons and animation and plays and, and puppetry. We need to tell our story through all the other kind of means of expression that let us know who we are as a people so long as it bonds us together as a people. So I don't think I answered your question. For the, yeah, who, how many out there are education majors? Okay, here's a tip. If you talk long enough to answer a student's question, they'll forget what the question they asked. <laughs> it's really, it's really effective. <laughs> Uh, I would probably pick the 1920s. It has to be familiar enough to me where I could actually operate and not look like a bumbling fool. Um, but also, you know, far enough away that there's some curiosity about it. Um, that's a good question. But um, When I wrote the, the book Kristallnacht, which is the story of a young boy fleeing the night of broken glass in Nazi Germany in 1938, um, I put myself into the, the character um, as, I, as I wrote the story. And when it was all said and done, um, you know, and the book was done, I, you know, I broke into tears. It was a, I had to let go of a friend. That was, that was someone who, over the course of last summer, I spent time with. Uh, and so uh, I don't want to go to Nazi Germany. Uh, <laughs> uh, I do have some, some Jewish ancestry, and so, yeah, I don't want to even t get close. So I'll, st I'll stay here. Uh, maybe San Francisco in the 1920s. Have dinner with. <laughs> Who's cooking? <laughs> You're cooking. Uh, oh, I don't know. People ask that all the time. And I go back and forth between Jesus and Abraham Lincoln. B before things went wrong for both of them, let's, right? <laughs> that would not be cool. <laughs> like, hey, there's a parallel here between both these guys, you know, going down. They had dinner with Joe Lath the night before each of them. <laughs> that would not be cool. <laughs> so, what else? Roy. Uh, that's a really good question, Roy. Um, I, um, I have very st strong um, spiritual beliefs, um, and I, I try not to um, express them in such a way that it's openly exposed as to what, what, what group or my affiliation might be with. Um, the, the, in the end, um, I hope that through my values um, that it doesn't matter. That the, the things that I'm, I hope I'm calling st students to think about, um, it, those, are, those are ideas and values that go across the board, that transcend denominations or sects or religions. Um, I, think, um, I think there's a place to foster it um, outside of the classroom through clubs, and, and whether it be the Newman Club or, or different organizations, um, and then linking up with recognized faculty. Um, but I, I personally um, am reluctant to infuse my religious beliefs into, into a class. I'm likewise you know, reluctant to infuse my political beliefs into the class. Um, I slam Democrats and Republicans equally as hard. Um, and, you know, uh, and we've got to, you know, be aware. Of, uh, it, I think most students would say that when you come to my history class, 
um, students are, are eyes are opened up um, to America's past. Um, you know, Mrs. McGillicuddy in third grade and Mr. Potratz in eighth grade and grossly obese Coach Schmucker in 11th grade, they taught a certain history that was, you know, fed to them by the, the school board and they had to teach it. And it was a very patriotic history of the United States. It was a, a, the United States as an exceptional place. Um, I, I approach it from a different way and that is we need to own our sins. We need to, you know, acknowledge them, own them, and then move on. Um, that we can't simply say, uh, oh, the good old days. <laughs> really, what, what good old days were there? Oh, oh, the good old days when we were lynching African Americans? Or was it the good old days when we were committing genocide against Native Americans? Or was it the good old days in which we were hanging Italians in New Orleans? You know, what good old days? The good old days before women's suffrage? So um, I, I think we need to own our mistakes and own our past um, in order to move forward. And, and the best way to know where you are um, in, in the world and how you got to where you are is through history. And I think, I think ultimately every single person in this room is a historian of one sort or another. You may not be trained as historians, but you are historical thinkers, right? None of you came in and tested the chair in which you sat. None of you said, well, what is this contraption? Will it, will it support my weight if I were to put my butt on it? Right? None of you said that. You, you, you had had previous experiences that told you, these are chairs, they, they support my weight, I will be fine. And you got here through historical circumstances, not just because of tonight, but you got here to Edinburgh by virtue of your parents and your decision to come here. And your parents were historical byproducts themselves. Well, you know, their parents coming out of the mines and the mills. And so if we understand who we came from, where we came from, it, it helps kind of help forge our identity and what's important to us, and also in doing so, help us kind of set that goal ahead of us in the future. Um, I, I say that and I will, I will also caution you, not you, Ryan, uh, but you know, sometimes we, we, we think a lot about the future. You know, the, those of you who are students are thinking, what, what's gonna happen in four years, two years? And, and you worry, and you know, you've, you've created in your head this image of, I'm going to have a, a home with a white picket fence, a minivan with stickers of my children, 2.5 children, I'll have you know, brown socks and I'll mow the lawn on Sundays, and you, know, you have this idealized vision of what your world's gonna be. And then when it doesn't happen, people get sad, people get hurt. When we, when we don't achieve our idealized vision, sometimes we, we hurt along the way. So I think it's important to be practical um, in you know, the goals you set for yourself, um, but also be flexible that, you know what, life is gonna give you some curves. Um, you know, Chris and I had plans for you know, retirement and vacation and doing this and that. Um, th those are kinda gonna be different now. Um, and so we have to rethink that. And so, but if you appreciate the route you've been on and, and recognize that you were the shaper of that route, then I think it's so much more powerful. Medication. <laughs> I am, I, I, my veins are filled with so much medication right now, you'd never believe it. I, I literally, I'm regrowing hair because of medication. No, I'm just, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know. I think it's always, it's been, it's been my shtick from day one. I've always wanted to have fun. When I was in college, I, I don't tell it to you as you, you, you didn't hear it from me, but my motto in college, I was still a good student. Let's see how I'm giving a lot of setup to this so that you understand. Uh, my motto in college was, you can always retake a test, you can never relive a weekend. <laughs> right? So, um, don't do that. <laughs> but, but the point is, you know what, live it. It's, 
it's your journey. You know, no one else is going to have your journey, so why don't you have your own? And if that means taking some risks and saying, you know, I'm going to go to grad school uh, and, and, and do so, whether it be here at Edinburgh or at the University of Oregon or somewhere across the country, step out. Go beyond your comfort zone and have that journey um, because it is yours. But the, the positive spirit, I, 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 I don't know. I can't. I'll just go back to medication. So, closing shots, parting comments, rude, foul language. You. you know that I end my uh, every class with questions, comments, complaints, grudges, grievances, random, irrelevant remarks, barstool gibberish. And it's only at the end when people start speaking up. So. Thank you folks for bearing with me.